Good afternoon. Um, welcome. Thank you for being here. For those of you who are in engineering and you watch Silicon Valley, the show on HBO, you will notice that I'm sporting to, to have solidarity this, which is a nerd's vest, uh, just so you know. Uh, we are excited to be here today because we started an adventure about eight weeks ago in earnest. And we took about 30 people from all walks of life and we introduced them to IoT. Now to give you some idea, the range of people that we, we, we took to this program, some didn't know what I, IoT was. What does IoT mean? Where do I see these? Others had some exposure to engineering, software engineering, and some other things. So we have the whole range. Um, and we took them through a process that involves working with IDT here on several occasions. If we're getting, before I get too far into the, the context of why we're here, I wanted to recognize a couple of people, several people, certainly Greg Waters and his lovely wife. I want to recognize uh, both of them. And where is Dr. Lena Tran? I saw her, I didn't know where she sit down. There you are, <laughs> Dr. Tran. She is uh, the Vice President of Strategic Partnerships and Workforce Development at San Jose City College. Both of these two, and also I'm, uh, I'm going to introduce a couple other people. They demonstrated a type of energy and leadership that, you know, basically make it happen. Make it happen. And we started it, and it took eight weeks, and we're, 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 you're going to get to witness some of the results of this. This will happen over two days. Uh, two days, and uh, three presentations per day. Um, let me also recognize, Ron, where are you, Stephen, and Mark. Uh, they're a, just a fantastic team to work with. Kadani, I don't know, I haven't seen him here today. Great team, we, we just worked it out and it, it worked beautifully. Um, the process started with introducing everyone to the concept of IoT. And we really wanted to sort of stoke their imaginations. If you look at the picture behind me, that is a picture on my laptop. Just happened to bring it today, but it has Disneyland. I've been inspired by Walt Disney for most of my life. I am an engineer by trade, software engineer. I've done many startups um, and teach as an adjunct faculty at San Jose City College now. But we wanted to inspire that type of creativity, but also uh, bring IoT to the masses. There's a democratization of technology that removes the complexity. In other words, you don't need a PhD to, to put a great idea together. And we want to apply that to those who want to seek out through education a better way of life. And I really, I think, I hope I encapsulated uh, your CEO, Greg uh, Waters' vision uh, in some sense. So uh, let me give you some numbers. We started off, there were about 30 that walked in that said, what is IoT or I want to be part of this. We have about 19 uh, in the program right now, and that's a natural amount of attrition and sort of thing. Some people say, wait a minute, I have to present to a whole bunch of people? Are you, are you crazy? I don't do that, right? Because if you can imagine, there's a lot of smart people in this room, and presenting uh, for some people is just like, you know, put, put a needle in my eyeballs. It's the worst thing they can possibly imagine. Um, in October, uh, we, we we started uh, forming teams. So we put a whole bunch of strangers together and we said, come up with an idea. And so the idea that you, the ideas you're going to see today and tomorrow didn't come from us. They came from the groups, people that had never met each other, brain, brainstorming ideas, things that make people's lives better. And now they're here to present. Now, the stages of the technology itself are in different levels. Well, you'll see. Um, does it work because we only had eight weeks to put it together to things that are actually quite pro prototypes. And some things where we're waiting for a type of sensor that may be on someone's drawing board, probably one of yours, that, that may exist in the future. So housekeeping. We'd like to see what you guys think about the presenters. It's part of the rubric that we'll use to, in order to provide a grade and to assess how they did in the class because they are getting units for a class. There are, if I can ask, um, maybe a couple people to pass out the, the form. They look like this. Uh, they're in the back. If you have a pen or a pencil, and uh, for, for each of the categories, I'd like for you to mark one through five on here based on if they covered that particular subject matter or not within the presentations. Now, the larger teams, the first team that will go up in just a minute, is one of our largest teams. It's five people. 
hopefully, uh, and the second team I believe is three, and the third team is one. So I offered to help out with some of the technical questions. Um, if I haven't seen her show up yet, it may be a short, but uh, we'll see how that works. Okay, some housekeeping. Um, each presentation cannot see, exceed 30 minutes, and that includes questions and answers. So 30 minutes total. Hopefully most of these will go a little bit quicker. Um, on the larger team, it's going to take a little bit longer because everyone gets to participate. Smaller team is going to be a little quicker, so we, we, um, we may not use all the time today. Please rate each, uh, each team, write down the team name, um, and, um, and pass those in at the, you know, at, as you leave. That would be great. Please ask questions. I'm going to kind of stoke the conversation with some questions to see how deep and, uh, an understanding they have, not only of the technology, but also of the market capability or, or value proposition uh, in the product itself. And most importantly, I've done this so many times, I had a, a good friend of mine as a Vice President Hewlett Packard come in and, and do sort of like a Shark Tank exercise. So that's kind of what you guys are doing. Um, and he was kind of mean, he was very direct. Uh, so be nice to the participants. So whenever you, you create a question, don't go too deep into the technical detail. Remember, they don't have a PhD. Uh, but do, you know, ask questions and kind of ferret out how much they know about the product, okay? Without further ado, our first team is the Smart Walking Stick. Have you come up? So here's a challenge you guys never want to try. Imagine you're a blind person walking with a walking stick, and you're constantly sweeping the floor for any obstacles. You're trying to avoid it, but doing this for a half hour, an hour, you're gonna, your arm will get really tired, and you're gonna have a repetitive strain injury to your arm. And um, so most of the uh, sidewalks on, in the U.S. don't have uh, tactile paving. So you, you have no sense of uh, direction where you're going. You, you might be uh, going off to a street, uh, to, a, yeah, to a street and run, run, in, run into, a, into a car. And if, what if there's something uh, like in the air, you're going to bump your head. And what if there's a, a pothole on the, on the ground? You, you're gonna, you, you have to uh, sweep the floor and you, your walking stick might get stuck in the, in the hole and you might not be able to get it out. And uh, if you're a blind person walking on a, a busy sidewalk, um, there are cars driving by in the morning, commuting hour. There's cars driving by honking and there's uh, people walking, there's a lot of uh, noise, distractions. And there's uh, people rushing uh, to get to work on time. And they might, uh, those people might uh, accidentally bump into you and actually, actually knock off your, uh, your can off your hand. So I introduce, uh, so according to uh, WHO, there are uh, uh, 39 million legally blind population in the, in the world. So introducing ICANN. So we are here today to represent you on Ultimate Health, which is ICANN. So we develop a can that can tell you if there is obstacle in front of you. So if there is an obstacle in front of you, the can will have a beeping sound to let you know so you can avoid it. And to be honest with you, you use it as easily as you use a normal can. You just hold it. And we want to build this can for
for everyone can use it. So it's really affordable. We have many package options to suit everyone's needs and budget. And as long as human needs eyes, there's some sort of visual support that we always need. And um, imagine if you go out at night and you get into something dangerous, more than just obstacle in front of you, we have the alert button. So when you press the button, it makes a huge noise to, assist, to, to attract people around that area to come to assist you. And never afraid of it running out of battery because it's very low energy consumption. And we have the alarm to tell you if it's run out of battery. Um, more things I want to mention is um, the, it's very accurate, accurate because it has narrow uh, detection, de detection range. It's 15 degrees, so you know exactly where the obstacle is. What we want to do for this uh, product, we build it so we can display our whatever disability or disadvantage you have. You can still going out to to have fun, to enjoy your life, and coming back home safely because you know you can avoid the obstacle in front of you. So no further ado, I will give you the demo of our first prototype. So this is our prototype I can, and this is the battery part, and this is the Arduino with the quantum center. So, and how you're gonna use it, that's a very easy. You just turn on the battery, and you can use it. So, when you are far away from the optical in front of you, you will not hear any beepy stuff. So, when you try to walk ahead, like almost 150 centimeter, you will begin in the beepy stop. So, yeah. And no, it's more than 150 centimeters away. That's why it's not beeping. But as you walk closer to the... I mean, and when you walk closer, you will hear the BB sound more faster and faster. So when you hear the BB sound more faster and faster, and you can try to make a slight turn a little bit to go ahead. And you won't hear any BB sound, so you can go ahead. Go, Jay. Keep walking. Yeah. Next, I can. And next, and now let me uh, figure out how we can import our iPad. So we have a few improvements that we believe will make our product stand out, especially from the competitors that we've identified. So first of all, we have vibration feedback that we want to incorporate. So we want to have a claw-like handle on the top of the stick. And that way, our fingers, which when spread out make a 90 degree angle around, will allow us to detect where more accurately the, where more accurately the uh, obstacle is coming from. So when you're holding it like this, your middle finger is the one that's right in front of you. So if, there, if the buzzer below my middle finger goes off, then that means the obstacle is right in front of me. However, if it goes off underneath this finger, then I know that it's the obstacle is in that direction and so on. Our next improvement is an array of sensors. So while we only have one sensor on our prototype as a proof of concept, we want to incorporate more detachable sensors for the user um, who has a larger budget to pay for um, along the walking stick so that they can detect any obstacle at any height up to five feet. Uh, we will also have a sensor on top of the stick to detect things that are coming from above. Um, next, we also want to have a GPS so that we can incorporate more feedback in terms of construction that may be happening one day and um, sidewalks that may not be so clear. Um, and anything that's a little bit more obscure that the walking stick may not pick up on its own. We also want to have a singular wheel at the bottom of the walking stick. Now because users are not using this for um, Oh, weight, like they're not using it to put their weight on, and they're using it to just dis detect obstacles, the wheel will help get over minor obstacles without falling into the pothole. Um, uh, and it will also allow users to not have to continually lift up the stick. It can just roll along any, um, 
any surface. Uh, lastly, we want to incorporate a lot more IOTs. So we either want to insert a, have an ins uh, insert a SIM chip into the stick or have it connect to the user's iPhone. And that way we would hopefully connect to Google Maps which can uh, I, uh, notify us of any, um, uh, again, any obstacles that we may not be aware of, any uh, complicated uh, walkways uh, can also be figured out with that. Um, and uh, one thing that we're pretty excited about is that we found um, uh, Arduino-based, in a future city planning kind of method, we, find, we found Arduino-based uh, traffic lights and, um, sit and uh, road bumps. And this way we could sync up with those um, traffic lights so that the user will be uh, notified when to go when to go at a stoplight and um, which direction they're walking in. Because when you're in a very crowded street, it's difficult to tell which direction you're going in. So with our competitors, we've identified one in India. Um, they have created a walking stick for the blind and it is around $50. So we believe our product stands out from them because, first of all, they only have one sensor with one direction um, in which the obstacle is detected. Second of all, they, ha they don't have a low battery alarm, and we find that this could be a problem for uh, users if they're left unprepared in the middle of um, uh, somewhere they don't know um, and the walking stick is not able to work. So we will have a low battery alarm. Um, last of all, uh, since we will have the wheel at the bottom of the stick, uh, they will not have to constantly pick up the stick um, to sweep the floor for low height obstacles, which we believe will, will make our stick better from our competitor. So now we will, we will see how all of these improvements fit into the business market. So since this is not established category of products, uh, we plan to go out um, through um, associations and um, service providers and medical uh, personnel that serve the uh, visually impaired community. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them, American Foundation for the Blind, uh, Brighton Society for the Blind, and so on and so forth. There's about eight that I was e easily able to find that, that do entertain <coughs> products for the blind, that they have some listings on their website. Uh, so we, and, they, and then there is, um, then the events and, and conventions and so on that they hold where we could put up a stall to introduce such a thing. So that is our thought for a new product introduction. Um, and we have a couple of packaging options. Uh, the least, the most inexpensive and the easiest entry point uh, would be something that you can put on an existing stick. Uh, with a single sensor just the way it is right now, perhaps more uh, tested and, and, um, and uh, validated. Um, and then for the top of the line that was just described, which has IoT features, we priced at around $38, about $8 for the stick. Again, this is all off of uh, Alibaba uh, website, um, <laughs> as long as the quantities are between one and 100. Um, about $15 uh, for the Arduino capable uh, base unit, about $10 for three banks of 15 degrees of um, sensors, so three vertical banks covering about 45 degrees, um, and about $5 for assembly. That was from a different site. Um, so we think that uh, we can put something like this together for about $38. And, uh, there's no market research or survey done, but we think it will sell for easily for $50. Um, and as the volumes go up, uh, I would presume that there's a 20-30% uh, cost reduction. Uh, so that's roughly what we had in terms of uh, pricing. Again, there's many angles to it, and feel free to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you. Have you thought of giving any thought about the walking stick actually talking to you sometime in the future instead of buzzing? 
So when we incorporate, um, hopefully in the future, when we incorporate Google Maps and other tracking, we would hope so because buzzing is probably not going to be uh, able to distinctify the different, uh, distinguish the different obstacles that are going to happen. Um, so yeah, when we have Google Maps, it'll function a little bit like Waze where it's going to give you different voices, tell you where to go. Um, so yeah, we would hope that we could incorporate voices as well. And also path planning is not out of question. Um, so maybe a visual instruction on where the person is trying to go and, and for the whole path planning to happen, including factoring in the, the obstacles. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, this is a very good idea. Uh, I try to simplify, not ask too, too many questions. Uh, number one is uh, the beeping. Right? So in a crowded area, the noise uh, around you is very strong. Maybe you can think about use the cell phone and to the earbud, and through the wireless you can enable the earbud to tell you there's something before. But secondly, with the sensor, the idea that people put a sticker is because there's no sensor helping them. They have to use a sticker to search around, you know, around them. But, but with the sensor, you can put somehow on the belt, you know, and it's just kind of attachment with your body. So eventually, the blind man doesn't need a sticker with your sensor. You can put more sensors around you, just like you drive the car. You can see all the environment. I think it just kind of gives some ideas behind. Absolutely. And I think to your last point, it's just why driver, uh, you know, self-driving cars still have a wheel, right? Yeah. So you might still end up needing it, but it's a great point. Thank you. Does yes. it sense uh, depth? No, it doesn't have ability for concave surfaces right now because the reflection from concave, as you know, is, is very complicated to assess. Yes. Um, have you thought about researching for material? Because I'm assuming this is a daily wear, so it gets a lot of use and tear. And I think material will be very important given that all the sensor and how do you make it lighter as well? Because as you add more component to it, I think material that actually build the can will be very important too. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think materials do need to be uh, really strong in order to keep the sensor safe. Um, one reason we put the wheel at the bottom is so that because the stick is getting so heavy with all the added sensors, they're not going to have to continually pick it up. They just need to push it forward roll it forward, which would be a lot easier, hopefully. So, so weight was a big consideration, because there's all kinds of sophisticated LiDAR and other sensors available. But you know, you can't install a car battery on a stick to drive the power that those need. So that was a big consideration in choosing a sensor technology that was feasible in this kind of use. Yes, once again, this is our first prototype. It will have a lot of upgrade, and we're definitely going to uh, do that about the material. It's a very good idea. Thank you. Yes, sir. I was going to say that since the uh, ping is connected to internet, why the uh, stick will you know, guide you home? Because this is as direction. So it can help them guide to your house. Yes. Yes. So yes. So his his question is a very excellent question. This this is what what we want to do when we do this product. So to get people get home safely. So uh, yeah. So as you say that we 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 want to get it into like connect to Google Maps in the future. So it's it's my set up the home as a default address. So they can get back home whenever their location is. Thank you. Yes, sir. So, so related related to that is yes. that if you if you have it uh, with GPS going on and stuff, but one of the other things that you can do is you can have you can test where where say for example McDonald's is or where say That's Burger right. King is That's and stuff. Right, yeah. And as you get closer to a particular store or a particular thing. That store could perhaps, you know, you could you could probably partner with them to say to, to get you know funding and, and stuff to provide a discount to the one person who's talking by the you know Barnes and Noble or whatever. Wow, that's a <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, just we say. definitely will. Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. Well, I wanted to hear actually a little more about the emphasis on the whole mapping system. Because I think when we talk about this particular project, one of the highlights to me was the ecosystem around basically 
providing that mapping service and the key is just a vehicle so you can actually add devices, take away devices, add features. But what intrigued me about this particular um, project was the opportunity to advance the whole mapping system, not only really rely on Google, but actually providing the source of every point of obstacle. We talked about the infrastructure within the municipal, the lighting system, the sidewalks, the tactile pavements. So to me, I think your core value is really the whole mapping system and not service that you're going to provide along with the data. Yes, yes. So it's uh, it's it, it's in our future business right. plan too. So um, that's 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 what we're trying to have. That like it's very affordable, so like many people can can use it. And and the more people use it, the more data we have. And we when when like when we have enough data, we can build the data system of our own. And like I just mentioned, like we want to do something about city planning as well. Maybe it's better for visual impaired people to uh, walk on the street, or maybe to build the city better. So yeah. when, oh, I, sorry, I think path planning factors into a lot of the uh, questions that I've heard. And I think that's something that, uh, like she said, we're planning to do. And we started with Google Maps because it's the easiest um, way to think about kind of, you know, incorporating all of that data that Google probably took a while to come incorporate. Um, but I think, I think I agree with you in that um, since we're also hopefully in a future city development kind of project, we're going to hopefully be interacting with street lights and other things like that. We're going to have to form our own system of location, which would hopefully be a big positive. Correct. Right. Right. Oh, I'm sorry, let me take this lady first. Uh, can I just add uh, one item uh, to Steve's question? So yeah, we only talked about how we leverage existing uh, services um, to make the stick a little bit smarter. But I think there is also the opportunity for all these hopefully thousands and millions of sticks uploading the data uh, and, and, and building confidence in various um, obstacles that are out there. And, and, and you know that could be reported to the user. There's you know 70% chance that you will have something in this location that you're headed to. So that's certainly the bigger opportunity. Yes. Yeah, so I, I understand that you're using the sensors to gather the environmental data around you. Mm -hmm. um, aside from the beeper, what is the feedback to the person? So um, we're going to have tactile feedback. Um, so there, and hopefully we would also be able to incorporate voices. That is our hope because it's going to be a lot easier. And I think like someone else had mentioned, because it gets busy, we would hopefully uh, be able to connect to their phone and they could use earbuds so that they can hear the directions very clearly. Um, but I think we start out with the buzzer because in a very, um, in, yeah, exactly, in a very uh, a straightforward kind of direction planning, it's going to be easiest for them to feel where to go um, uh, rather than if they're in a very complex environment then they may have to hear directions turn left here turn right here uh, and so also right now the prototype that you're you're showing is for less complex environments, environments. yeah, yes. yeah. Thank you. And, and there's the tactile feedback on the handle that i think was brought up uh, with the five and fingers that's there now no, no it's not, uh, okay. it won't be on the first product it's, it's a this project by itself yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is a prototype Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation that you said 30 million uh, people were... 39. <laughs> Have you done an analysis of where they're actually located? Your presentation seems to be very city-centric. Where is it from? Where do you think uh, there's a uh, first one. So it's actually by country. Uh, in just, uh, it's not in just uh, U.S. cities alone. I mean, so, everything you discuss sounds great, but it just seems to be focused on the support network of cities and light poles and some you know, infrastructure that can interact with the king and the majority of people are able to use us in the village. Yeah, that's, that's true. At, at the most basic level, it is still an obstacle. Um, detecting system, standalone, without any internet services or anything like that. But you're right that those won't be available in a good part of the world. 
Um, the only thing is that I, I agree. I think we're a little bit in our Bay Area bubble, so we think of everything as busy and kind of city life is here. But I think um, although we've added accommodations for city life, I think if you would have to have whole communities starting to use these in other areas because that is where the information from each user would factor into the data system for everyone figuring out where the obstacles are. So if everyone in uh, some place that is unknown started using the stick, then they would all gather the information that would allow them to kind of start uh, finding their directions with the stick more often. But I completely agree with what you're saying. Oh, I think he had had his hand up for a while. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. Good, good. Uh, my only comment was that the uh, thing about the environment would be working great. And if it snows, how much the snow is going to be you know, detected because it does melt or it does come up when somebody is shoveling. So something to think about real practical application. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. When I'm shoveling my driveway and I piled up something and now somebody's walking, that never was an obstacle there. Yes. And all of a sudden, so keep something in mind. So, so yes, you'll certainly detect you, yes. that, yeah. uh, but uh, I think uh, you know how much noise to signal ratio. I mean, that's a good. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Yes. I, I had a comment and question. First of all, I think it's very impressive, right? It's very thoughtful. You really thought through this. I particularly liked how you thought through the future roadmap or some of the possibilities. Uh, so I, I, I thought it was superb. My, my, my question is, for those of you that don't know, this class is really short. It's only about 12 weeks long, 11 weeks. So you, the, the teams have had like, no time at all to get this stuff together, meet each other, get something to work. So I think it's very impressive you've got something to work at all. Right? So you, and you pulled it off. So my question is, what was the hardest part of getting the current demo to work? I mean, where did the team have the biggest struggle to work? The demo that we Let's uh, figure out the wiring and how to, because uh, uh, building this demo, we actually burned three sensors. We uh, <laughs> inverse the polarity of the, the, the uh, sensor. We burned three. And then we also had to uh, figure out the coding part, like how, how like uh, if it's, how, how fast it should be yes. as you come closer to the object. Yes. Obstacles. So, yes, so. May you pass that cane around? I would love to see it. <laughs> also, okay, we cycled through three ideas before yeah. arriving to this. And some of them, um, we couldn't find the right sensor in the right amount of time. Um, others would be too expensive. Like there was one idea whereby there would be a bed of sensors. So, assembling something like that. So, this thing really was the third most practical. Idea and then the sensor selection, I think, was really hard because there's such a um, such a great variety and quality of sensors out there. So it came down to power, really. You know. And I think a huge part of at least what I learned through this was the trade-offs because I think you know you you're adding so much to a stick, but I think as someone commented, what about the weight? and what about different environments. So if you're gonna accommodate for those different environments and you're adding more things, and how much is that gonna complexify each thing? So I think kind of finding the balance be between like how much we wanna add and how uh, easy we wanna make it for each person, each scenario, um, was definitely a big learning curve because that is not a very light addition and our um, if improved stick would have that along the entire stick. So it's definitely something to think about and something we have to um, plan out a lot for our presentation. I'm trying to be respectful of time because we have, we have two more presentations. So we'll maybe take one more question. Yeah, Yeah, hi, just a quick question. Because it's sort of um, orders on being a medical device to visually impaired, have you thought of like, what qualification process you have to go through? Does this have to go to FDA or does it have oh. to... Oh uh, yes, so uh, we we did talk about it and dis discuss, especially we discussed with Mr. Steve here, and this is like an aid, like uh, um, an, an aid for 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 yourself. It's it's not a medical in a medical terms, like it's, not it's something. Not a medical device. Yes, it's yes. not a medical device, so it's just an aid for you. Yeah, DME would have been a great place to get funding. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> All right. Okay, thank you.
first giving a big thank you and shout out to Greg and Carolyn Waters, uh, SJCC IDT staff for um, walking with us, guiding us, and collaborating with us in this fun and educational process where we could actually explore our ideas and make them into a reality. So first and foremost, thank you. Uh, ideas, they come in so many different shapes and forms, right? You know, you get so many of them from different people and, you know, different ways, but particularly in this sphere, in this room, or my group, I should say, we were interested and in, engaged in the topic and the idea of how to make things technologically disruptive and helpful. So with that said in mind, my group and I, as we're going to be presenting the product, do keep four things in mind, not that they have a particular order, but we're going to be talking about the functionality, we're going to be talking about future expectations and prospect to enhance user mobility, we're going to be talking about the market, we're also going to be talking about how overall we can actually have this used in everywhere in the Bay Area, United States, and other countries as well. Now you guys were a little tough earlier, so go easy on us. <laughs> Enjoy. What makes up a modern day prosthetic? Uh, from the top, a modern day prosthetic consists of four main components. A uh, liner, a socket, a pylon, and a foot. A uh, liner protects the residual limb, that's the part of the, um, the body that was previously amputated or what's left. Uh, the socket keeps the residual limb in place and the pylon is the backbone of the prosthetic. That um, is either made of titanium, stainless steel, or of aluminum and then there is the foot piece on the bottom. And while there have been new discoveries in the prosthetic industry in the last few years, like this, the use of smart knees to help calculate ideal gait while the patient is walking, uh, the industry has been far too stagnant for its own good. And problems still persist in the industry that should have been solved a long time ago. And one of these problems is sweat. Now, sweat can build up in the liner and the socket of the prosthetic and can lead to an array of problems. And the sweat buildup can lead to infection, which can then lead to gangrene, which can lead to further degradation of the limb or potential death. Now, this is more of a problem when it's taken into consideration and the majority of prosthetic users also have type 2 diabetes thus becoming more susceptible to potential infection. So the problem we wish to tackle is how to manage sweat levels in the prosthetic limb. Because if left ignored, this can snowball into an array of other problems. And this affects, um, this becomes more of a problem even more because uh, 4.3 billions annually is taken into account for post-amputation medical problems. And with an already 2 million people living with limb loss in the United States and approximately 185,000 each year in the United States alone, additionally, uh, with those people that have amputations, 55% of them will then require uh, further amputation in the next two to three years due to them also having diabetes. And now here to present the smart leg and the future we'll have in the industry, T. So as you saw, the, the users of uh, prosthetic leg, they cannot feel the sweat, the heat inside uh, the, uh, the leg. Uh, so that will cause many problems to the health, like uh, um, Jaime just mentioned. So we, our product will solve that problem. We will use the sensor, two main sensor. We're going to use a humidity sensor and temperature sensor. Mm -hmm. So that it will uh, measure, it will detect how, how sweat inside, how, uh, how much the hotter temperature inside so that it will notify to the user. By, um, we have, uh, we, we, we're going to set up three lights. Oh, going to go back. So, uh, for example, with three light, if uh, the notification with the green light, it's a normal temperature. So the user just ignore that. And if the, it's a yellow, it's a warning. And if the uh, the light uh, show up that on red, so that uh, the user must have to take care about the, the sweat inside. 
they uh, should take off uh, the legs for for um, take care of that. If they keep, uh, that will uh, cause a lot of problems. So yes, and besides, we all also uh, save the data so that um, the doctor or the user can assess by their phone to know uh, how the, the their condition inside the prosthetic leg. Mm, and we have one main competitor, um, they, they also solve that problem. They use the fans uh, to uh, reduce the temperature and the sweat inside. However, um, I think there are some uh, disadvantages of their products. It is uh, really noisy with the fan. So, um, and it's heavy also, with three miles added to the, the legs. And they're going to... Uh, produce their products at the end of this year. Mm -hmm. So our product we use uh, based on two sensors and besides we also use uh, a wireless connection so we can save the data for uh, the doctor can assess uh, so that they can have uh, some suggestion or treatment to the patient. So uh, Matt is going to introduce some uh, data integration. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one second here, I'm going to show our humidity sensor readings that we have up here. So here, going to the IDT demo ISG thing. And I'm sorry, is this not showing up on here? Oh, it's not showing up. Oh. Um, so we have it connected here if you want to see. Oh, there you go, that'll work. <laughs> the tide, this couldn't be up here on the screen, it'd be bigger. But uh, yeah, we have the humidity sensor reading. And just blowing in here, this will be the main technology we're make, taking advantage of. As you see here, the spike in humidity, and that's the main thing that our smart leg is looking for, is the spike in humidity. So here, um, now we're going to talk about the data integration part of things. Okay, so the main thing is with getting all of this humidity sensor data, we are going to have a huge, huge amount of data for everyone who would have a smart leg prosthetic regarding the humidity. And our plan is to upload this data through a service like AWS to the cloud so it can be kept track of over time for both the wearer of the smart leg as well as their physician. And so our plan after that is to make a companion app that would be for smartphones as well as a version that could be accessible by desktop. And by being act, able to access the humidity readings, we can give notifications to both the patient and the doctor saying, your humidity levels have been going up. They've been much higher than normal. You are currently at risk for developing some problems. Uh, you might need to make some changes, get some new bandages and gauze and such. And this way we can help minimize the losses that go to insurance companies because oftentimes when gangrene or a complication like this happens, the competition decides, you know, we're just going to have to throw this new leg out and at a cost of over five to fit, ranging up to $50,000 for a prosthetic leg. Adding a $40 sensor into things would definitely help things out in the long run with the amount of smart legs that would not need to be replaced as opposed to the competition. So one thing we're in our future plans we're thinking of adding on, but we haven't really gotten to yet, is a weight sensor because a lot of times a complication that people with prosthetic limbs have is they lose or gain a lot of weight after getting a prosthetic leg. And this can be problematic because as the prosthetic leg is very expensive, part of the reason for that is because it's crafted for an exact weight and size of a person. So 
like I was saying earlier, the competition's idea is if someone no longer can wear the leg, they have to replace it. So our goal would be to attach a weight sensor that could give readings. It wouldn't have to be nearly as often as the humidity sensor because obviously a person's weight can change by hour depending on what they eat or drink. So if it were, if we get hourly, or not hourly, but daily or 12 hour readings for the sensor, we can minimize the need to replace uh, prosthetic legs in the future. So that would be an advantage and a way for us to be profitable. So for our outlook, we, um, we got some research uh, from the Grandview Research saying that the O&P market, orthotics and prosthetics market, is an estimated 8.15 billion last year. And as, as Jaime was pointing out earlier, there are a lot of people with prosthetic legs who have type two diabetes, and there's a rising number of amputations and a growing prevalence of complications such as osteosacroma around the world, which are poised to drive our market. So in terms of our market outlook, we have there's never going to be a world where people don't need prosthetic legs, and we actually see one where there's an increasing number coming up. Mm -hmm. And so we actually have, have plans to make some partnerships with companies because this would be a good way to get profitable quickly by merging with people in the O&P world, like distributors and patient care services who already have a market presence and a foothold. So Jaime here is going to talk to you some more about those partnerships. So along with IBT, we would love to work with Cascade and SPS, already two leading giants in the industry when it comes to distribution. They have locations across the U.S., some locations in Europe as well. So getting in with them would help distribute the product beyond the U.S. And as for distribution, that's all covered. And then when it comes to getting into the hands of the doctors, there's hangar clinics. This is where the implementation would better be used and be put in the right hands so it can reach an ever-growing market. And thank you so much for all your help, and we're open for questions. <laughs> yep. I have more, more of a, just a statement. Um, I really appreciate the research you guys did behind this. Uh, my father is an amputee, so everything that you're speaking of, I'm like, oh my god, just develop it already. You can use that, right? Yeah. Talk to uh, us. <laughs> right? So the, the maturity of the bone density that changes from amputation to it maturing um, activity level. Uh, weight management, the humidity in the leg is all extremely um, relevant, um, whether it be for diabetes or somebody with vascular disease. So I don't have a question. I just want to commend you guys on your research and the real life application behind it, mm -hmm. having it be a first hand situation that I'm in at home awesome. with uh, my father. So I just wanted to commend you on that. That's okay. good to hear. Thank like you. Uh, talking to my brother, he had a, about this. He was saying, "I have a friend who actually lost her foot in the Boston Marathon bombing, the unfortunate incident, incident a couple of years ago." And he was saying, "Yes, she deals with these problems that we were describing." So it was happy to hear we're somewhere on the right track with that. Yeah, awesome. And the original concept for this did originate from. I used to volunteer at a prosthetic clinic. And the original idea came from one of our patients who unfortunately passed away due to gangrene complications. And it's surprising me that nothing like this has been like implemented before. Mm -hmm. um, the competition we put up before by Bivonics, the ICE prototype, mm -hmm. is an idea, but it's an idea that's been tried and tested and failed before trying to implement a fan or they've tried liquid cooling in the past. But the problems always persist that it's too noisy, it damages, it's just not, the concept is good, mm -hmm. but the implementation mm -hmm. is faulty, yeah. which is why this is a, a better alternative that I could see working in the future. Mm -hmm. I just kind of curious about the specific like, technologies that you used in terms of like, what kind of sensor, what kind of um, processor, like overall, you want to talk about that all? 
So the main sensors we have so far, obviously, is the humidity and flow sensor, the Wi-Fi hub, and our goal is to connect those to, to the unit, like obviously um, using some soldering type tools. And as Stephen was pointing out, the humidity part of the flow sensor is actually like the smallest part of here. So we could quite easily fit that into that. Um, eventually, we would want to involve the Arduino or Raspberry Pi to help with gathering the data and uploading it to AWS, because that's one of the main parts of this, is getting all of that. And as we keep going on, there's going to be things to add on, such as the weight sensor. Yeah. And if we need to uh, wire wirelessly charge it, we know that at IDT were the leaders in wireless charging. So when you go to sleep, just put your uh, sensor and let it charge. I was also kind of, kind of curious what drove the decision to use um, Wi-Fi specifically versus other uh, wireless or plugging in directly or other options. So, well, do you want to take it? Yeah. I mean, well, for one thing, the the foot is something we want to be mobile. Yeah. So I think having it plugged in wouldn't be as well. So we felt like looking at the same type of battery technologies that mobile phones and computers have and are designed to be better over time and lithium batteries situations like that so that's kind of why we we went with the Wi-Fi because we're thinking obviously this is going to be a mobile piece of technology yeah, to follow yes. the question I think probably this is kind of an all side for the future if we can any more short range uh, wireless receiver receiver on all device Wi-Fi is kind of more long range. For, for this kind of short range, Bluetooth, low power Bluetooth probably make more sense. Correct. But I have a question is regarding the attachments. So basically, sensors should be close to the skin. Mm -hmm. And uh, how we can enable the sensor really close to the area is really you detect the moisture in, in that region. Great question. I mean, yes, I, I got this. So, uh, <laughs> ideally, we want to put the, uh, so ideally we want to put the sensor, like I mentioned before, every one of these prosthetics has a socket. And the socket is mostly made out of carbon fiber. So, uh, you can drill into there and get into the actual inner part of that that has the liner, which not every prosthetic has, but most of them are adding them more and more into there to help protect the limb. And the liner itself is mostly just cloth. So a sensor can be drilled into the carbon fiber layer leading into the cloth, thus connecting it closer to mm -hmm. the actual area we want to target. Mm -hmm. And the same would go for the, the weight sensor we want to implement into the future as well. Well, last question. This is also for both of your teams. Did you actually uh, shoot the video put to the YouTube for advertising? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No? no. Uh, not that we know yeah. of, no. <laughs> Thank you for the idea. That was a bright <laughs> idea. Thank you. What type of humidity levels are we talking about being sort of, like how much humidity would you have to get rid of? I mean, you said your competitor has a fan, but it's very noisy. Have you looked at membrane technology for removing humidity? Yes, um, so in the past, um, they used to put uh, different types of like liner would be built out of like different materials, right. but the problem is like it would also like kind of degrade away over like constant use, and not the liner itself like um, would just add to the like the additional cost like if it was like swapped because the liner is supposed to be replaceable. It's supposed to be right. like taken in off or tossed away and replaced with a new liner. Mm -hmm. This would help like if we put the the smart leg implementation here right. that can stay on. Yeah. That can like be like a constant thing. Well, the liner is just constantly tossed away and adding more to the cost. Well, this is a one-time situation thing. Yeah, no, the reason I ask you because they came out now with these membrane de de dehumidifiers that fit on the surface. So when you apply current to it, it allows moisture to travel in one direction only. So you can actually reduce humidity by quite a lot, and it's silent. Okay, this is new information to me, but I do appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Right. Yeah, yes. my question is you. Just, just one. You know what I really liked about the way you approached the problem is you think that it's an important problem. You know, this is obviously important to a lot of people in the world. When you chose the scope in a way that you solved a valuable problem, but it wasn't an overwhelming scope. And when we all do this, right, as engineers and developers, you get these cool ideas, you get excited, and then you bite off more than you can chew. And, and the way that you guys just zeroed in on the sweat and humidity type issue, I thought it was very practical. 
right? And then, you know, once you solve that, then you can add more features to it later. Sure. So I, I uh, give me a shout out with that one. Thank you. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> uh, Okay, we have one more presentation, but I'm going to give you a little bit of background on this one. So you had the first team present, and there were five people on the team, you had a lot of contribution. You had the second team, of course, a team of four on the prosthetic leg. The next team started off with a team, I think, of three or four, but it's now down to one. Wow. Normal attrition, it was, uh, I guess, the, the dice came up with the wrong number. That's okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to help. So you're going to see me step in. Why don't you come on up, and I think we're already so by the way, um, if you are bold enough, it was a team of one to come up and, and to present, I think you're already <laughs> successful. So, <laughs> uh, so, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you guys are having a good day today. So, my name is New. It's right in the middle. Because uh, on my passport, they put my middle name on first, so you can call me either my middle name or my first name, anyway. And this is my holy name, Anna. So you can call me by any other name. So, <laughs> so um, the teacher called to bring something here today. So unfortunately, I don't have a prototype yet. So I bring in that peppermint oil. So what I'm going to do is like, um, I'm going to put one or two on my hand, and then I smell it. Cause it helped it helped me awake, focus. So I'm gonna pass it out to everyone. Please try it. So this is our almost not our, but you can try. It. So these are I have two types. One is regular one. The other one is organic. That for the price, but it's a, so the reason why I bring it here today because it is related to my device. And I call it the four cent housekeeper. Why? You're gonna see it later. And the name of it, I call it T4A, and it, as a side, the, the, the letter four is very similar to A, so I call it TAR. It's similar to say thank you, TAR. So one of the most um, important reasons, so I put the uh, phonetic TAR because we need to educate the consumer how to call it, so I call it TAR. So, today I'm going to present about TAR. So there are only two parts of it, about the product and the market. So TAR, as I said before, is stand for the four cents housekeeper. Why is process? Because my device or my housekeeper is going to combine four types of sensors. And it's related to touch, which is temperature, sees, face recognition, smell, the very important part of this, and hearing with speed recognition. So I would like to share with you guys this, my own story. So one day when I was in class, right, in history class, so I forgot that peppermint oil. So I, I fell asleep. So I wish, but like, oh my God, I wish that somebody can like put the oil somewhere so I can smell it, so I can wake up. I'm not a coffee person, so I just use that oil. So I have an idea, like, because the class is very quiet, so I have a, an idea pop up in my mind. So why don't they make something like when they see the class is very quiet, very slow, they put the oil into the air so that wake up the audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like you got, I think you got a great right now, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, but somehow it had a problem. You got a wait, but you guys don't make noise, right? So it need, it need to, it need face recognition. Some cameras to detect your eye. If it, you guys got tired, your eye will close. And you shake your hand, something like that. Um, and when that sensor works, it would touch the um, temperature. The temperature of the air conditioner will uh, work and the temperature goes down. And they put the air, and for the speed recognition, it works when you like, um, you put it manually. 
because sometimes it will last long for you. Okay. So sometimes when you want to sleep, but they put the peppermint oil. So what happened? It's going to be smart enough to recognize your spirit. You, you will, would like to strengthen it to lavender because lavender will calm you down. So like in the room, when it's too noise, you want to put lavender to calm the crowd down. Okay. So for the product, I will call it a T48 herb or tar herb. So if you combine this optical sensor with camera, I don't think I can find it on IDT website. So I got it from somewhere else. It's your competitor. So an optical sensor with camera. And for sound, this is uh, really similar to Alexa. I really like it, but the problem is that it doesn't connect to any uh, air purifier. It just connects to music. I don't think it works enough to weigh you up, right? So, and with temperature, this is, I found it on IDT. There's a punch of sensor that you can use to control the light, the humidity. Very smart. And this is a very important one, the IAQ sensor. And it has a variety of like, uses for bathroom, for kitchen, for the HVAC system, for anywhere. And this is, I'm not like marketing for the but this is the, <laughs> <laughs> this is the, the effect of a type of oil. So this device may have a bunch of oil so that you can use so let's imagine you go into your house and you want to smell like you're in the beach. So you will put some like lemon or orange. So let just to let you guys know that orange you will make you feel happy. Trust me, I tried it. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you feel with the peppermint oil now? It's good. It's good? It's good. I hope it will wake you up in the middle of the mid-afternoon because you have to work later. Right? <laughs> you're putting off yourself. <laughs> I got the idea from the new school class last semester when the, my teacher introduced me to that. Before I had no idea what to use that for. So right now it's my best friend. <laughs> okay, so how much does it cost? Is it very, uh, I don't think it might work because, but I, when I start on the internet, essential right now is $10, $10 to $12. It's retail price. And this thing is $50, the, the camera is around $100, but um, we will need some diffuser around $50 more, so it will cost us around $200, but with the tariff, it's gonna be go up more, so the price is gonna around $500. So next year, gonna be 25% more for the tariff for Chinese stuff, so. <laughs> <laughs> And this is not including installation and maintenance fee because we're gonna create an app to, uh, because it's a hub, so we need a hub, on, uh, sorry, an application for the user to communicate with this. So about the market. So as another reason for me to show this because I found that drowsiness is way more dangerous than drinking. It costs six thousand fatal accidents per year in the United States. And when it comes to working place, it may cause the, the productivity go down a lot. And for this kind of device, it's going to be useful for any kind of house, any kind of building. And we have two types of building in the United States or overall. is residential or commercial. So residential, we have 132.78 million housing units. And commercial, we have 5.6 million buildings in the United States. This is the state in 2012, right now it's go more. So in commercial, we have a lot of like, uh, based on the, uh, the feature of that building, we have warehouse, food service, public assembly, healthcare, hospital, religious worship in church, lodging, hotel, education, school, service, food sale. And this, the conference room we're in right now is one of the um, prospects that I'm aiming to. So for the marketing sales, 
I'm gonna create a plan which is I call it 360 degree, which uh, because it it will combine three dimensions. For, I'm sorry, four dimensions. It direct then direct online with VR with event, and for each type of channel, I will, we actually we will create a lot of event. And why it have to be connect each other because each one connect each other. There's no single channel that can work only by itself. So it has to be a 360 degree plan. And overall to control it, we will need to have a customer relationship manager, or which is a CRM um, system to control every lead we have. So as on the process of making this, I'm going to IDT website and they make me fill in my email. So this just is like the way that you guys get lead and then make the lead into prospect and customer. So I'm hope, hoping that the kind of device will work well in the market, in the United States, and in the future, want to go spread over, over the world. So in the market right now, I, as, I as I see, there's no device like this. They can touch your, your like, uh, can put music, hearing, they can tell you, but they don't put the oil. They don't touch your like olfactory sensor. So this type of device combines four out of five basic uh, human sense. So hopefully it can be a helpful housekeeper for you guys. Thank you. Right. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me. If I don't, if I can, I can. <laughs> Well, yes. thanks to share with us and also educating us how to figure out this oil. I never tried it. I think it's kind of good learning. Uh, at the same time, you kind of remind me, just go to the go to hotel, you know, the restroom, they automatically, you know, spread the oil, the, you know, for, right. So I think probably if I'm whatever the idea you have, I feel it's kind of so diversified. Maybe you should focus, concentrate a little bit, make it simple and believable. Like temperature, humidity, if you can measure that in the room, and eventually it can cause you all your spray in somewhere. I think probably that's the first step. If you're going to combine more sensor, you know, visionary, and that with this image sensor, all the stuff, it's going to be too complicated and also more expensive. So integration is going to be more complicated. Uh, thank you for your comment. I really like it. But the reason I make this become a smart home because it can raise the, the value for the house. So one of the prospects of this may be the retail, I mean the um, real estate, because right now they, they, if they want to resell the house, they want to put more value on it. So what if they call it a smart home? Imagine how higher the price is going to be. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes? Hi, um, I, I, I just want some comments. So as a student of this class, I. I really appreciate, like, I think you really raised, like, when your teammate quit on you and you still continue <laughs> on the yes. I, I understand, the, like, doing the huge amount of work in yeah. sh a short time, like, it's really stressful. So I just want to congratulate you for doing this. Yeah. interesting question. Actually, I never heard, um, I never thought of the pet, but because the pet, um, <coughs> the owner might know the pet, so the owner may have, may have to read the mind of the pet, so they have to uh, trust that device to, uh, to uh, somehow it's help the pet, not affect the pet. Yes, it's the, respons the responsibility of the owner. 
Actually, as a pet owner, I wouldn't mind having this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, yeah. But a statement, um, I think out of all the projects that we talked about, this one came at me at the left field, honestly. <laughs> but I truly think that your value here is really using IoT as a vehicle, but your oil itself is the main commercialization uh, product in your project. And if this was a real shark tank, I think you have a winning business yeah. selling the oil, honestly. And the knowledge you have about utilizing the oils and different activities and waking us up or calming us down as we spoke about, the device itself is really just your mechanism in actually getting all these essential oils into the home, workplace, schools, and everything. So, brilliant idea. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just wanted to follow up on what Stephen was saying. Um, I love this peppermint oil. <laughs> I'm literally going to run out and buy some. Um, I, and I'm, I'm afraid of technology. I work at a technology company and I really, really try to stay away from technology. So I'm a really good consumer for you because you need to convince me of why wouldn't I just buy the oil? Um, and I don't quite understand that from this project, so I was wondering if you could help me understand what is the sensor sensing when you when I put this cub in my house and I know that the sensor is going to tell me when I need the peppermint oil. What is the sensor sensing? So it the um, uh, so it has four sense of type. I mean four type of sensor, right? It can recognize your speech. You can tell them. I can say, put out the peppermint oil. Yeah, like, okay. yeah, like that, yeah. Okay, or you can yeah, like, yeah. Or you can say like, I want to be happy, so they can change the orange oil. Yeah, okay. I want to, yeah, I want to be awake, peppermint oil. I want to sleep, lavender. I want to go to sleep. So <laughs> yeah, I yeah. Get it. So it's kind of like a combination of Alexa. Yeah. But I, but I'm telling Alexa what I want to be, not what I want to hear. Oh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, mean, I, I remember in our conversation, I have a friend that's working on a technology that listens to you as you're talking, and based on certain stresses, the inflection of your voice, it tells whether you're sad or happy. And so this can this can um, trigger the disposition, you know, the display of certain oils. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> you know where else this idea would be interesting is inside a car. Right. And it would happen really fast, so uh, it's interesting. Um, so just another idea. And now all IDT people will smell like peppermint. <laughs> 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 yeah. I was just wondering, did you look into uh, like chemical sensing or anything at all? Is seeing, you know, you can maybe monitor uh, if it's dropped below the level that a human can sense the scent or something like that by monitoring you know, whichever mo molecules are dispersed by the, the oil dispenser. Did you look into any sort of uh, sensors that would be mm. looking at those specific things? There's, there's like, um, on the way searching for this project, I found that there's the device that detects the smell, that a personal device that can detect the smell. When you smell bad, it can tell you. <laughs> yeah, so that, I don't know the uh, technology after that, but I think that's brilliant. So, um, I think it's the same technology we can use that mm -hmm. because this help can like I hope it can like detect the smell and can tell the user what kind of smell the house is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well let's give her a big hand. That was great. Uh, that's because it can detect the smell, so I think it can tell like your perfume is not good. <laughs> <laughs> that would be beneficial to you. <laughs> <laughs> because sometimes the perfume, like to some people, is too much, so they don't say it, but it's still too much. <laughs> yeah. So I hope that if I can help us with that problem. Yeah. Yes. Very good. Good job. Good afternoon. This is Valerie and Danish 
and I'm Matt, and we're, we are Bon Vivant. So quick survey, anybody here have food allergies or know somebody in your family that has food allergies? Quick raise of hands. Perfect. Anybody else have had experienced food poisoning this year or something that the food didn't agree with you? Anybody? Perfect, exactly, that's why we are here. We're here today to talk about an infrastructure that has been broken for a while now. And we're gonna talk about the problems that are associated with that, okay? So by the time we are done presenting, the problems will have killed 24 people. That means in a year's worth amount of time, that's 400,000 people, a third of which, which are children. So it seems like we have a problem here, right? Cool. So, on a less lighter, well, on a lighter note, let's go on. I'm gonna throw some statistics at you. So if you look down your row and look back, one of you has had eaten contaminated food or rotten food this year, which has resulted in you uh, having the fabulous journey of hugging that porcelain throne, as I like to call it. And if you don't get that joke, don't worry, I'll explain that to you afterwards if you want. But if you're not convinced that there's still a problem here, Let's talk about waste. So all the food that is grown, and let's just take the United States, all the food that's grown, about a third of it will not reach its destination. It's a problem, people. A third of that food is not reaching its destination. Okay? I'll play devil's advocate for you. Why is this important? <clears throat> you know? You don't know these people who are dying, okay? Oh, I, I understand that. I understand that waste, and there's an overabundance of food already, okay? I, I agree with that. But let's talk about something a little bit deeper. Your wallets. This is where it's really impacting us as Americans. In just America alone, this is $600 billion of waste each year. If you look around the room, you see $2,000 worth of waste coming out of each of our pockets, and not only prices, but in taxes. So that's a lot of money, people. I don't know about you, but I don't want to keep paying that. But since we are getting taxes, somebody's got to be doing something about it. I'm glad. Let's go to the next slide. I'm glad I brought that up. So the FDA is receiving about a billion dollars worth of funding each year. And I do have to give them credit. They're doing a fantastic job at keeping foodborne illnesses at a stagnant level. I'll give them an even better appreciation because our population is rising at an exponential rate. Okay? But they're keeping it stagnant too. But it's like putting a band-aid over a bleeding wound. You're actually not solving the problem, you're actually just solving, you know, a, a, a symptom of it. Okay? So out of all the foods that um, make us sick, these are the top big ones, and I want you to look at that and kind of look through see the stuff that you eat on a daily basis. We're gonna be focusing on our niche market is beef, which is about 9% of that population. Okay? And when you guys are done with that, I really want you to focus in on what I'm about to say. At Bon Vivant, our goal is to turn you, the consumer, into an informed consumer who knows where your food has been, how long it took to travel to where it's going, what conditions it was in, and that the product that you want is actually the product you are getting. And you're kind of thinking to yourself, well, what do you mean by that last sentence? That's kind of a weird sentence. <coughs> well, interesting enough, food fraud in the United States is a $10 billion lucrative business. It's crazy, $10 billion of food fraud. That means the product that you think you've been eating may not actually be the product you've been getting. So let's take filet mignon for example. You think you go to Costco and you pick up, hopefully not Costco, but you know, you go to the store and you pick out your filet mignon too. That could be fake meat or mystery meat or some lower quality of meat. Again, that is not acceptable. Okay? Let's dive into that old infrastructure and show where that has been going wrong. Okay, so this is our food supply chain. Again, this is a simplified version, but it gets the point across. We start from the fields and go all the way to your kitchen. And as you can see, there's a lot of trading off points. And again, more processing and trading off points and processing, a lot of time for something to go wrong. 
A lot of accountability changes, a lot of reliability changes, a lot of traceability issues. Okay? Let's go into specifically where those are at. So from the farm to the processor, this is where a lot of that food fraud happens. Again, if you're looking to make some money, you may want to join this industry, but it's pretty disgusting in my opinion. Okay? If we go from the processor to the distributor itself, this is where it affects me and anybody else who has food allergies. <clears throat> so I have nut allergies, and as all of you know, that's, pretty, that's a pretty nasty one. So what it means on a day-to-day -day basis is when I go to the store and I pick up a product, let's say it's um, like potato chips or something like that, and it says, has been processed with um, nuts, or maybe in a facility that has processed nuts. Again, I'm not getting a definitive answer, guys. This is 2018, I'm getting a May. I don't know about you, but if you knew your health was at risk and you're getting a May answer, that's, again, that's not acceptable, okay? Sorry, I digress a little bit. I'm passionate about that. Um, going from the distributor all the way to the re retailer, this is where a lot of spoilage happens, unfortunately. This is where we get a lot of that waste because, again, we're having that temperature change all the way from the farm and humidity changes um, really taking their toll. And again, viruses and bacteria really decaying the food at this point. So I'm going to take a step back and kind of recap what we're trying to address. There's a broken infrastructure. Let me go back and show you what it is. There's a lot of trading off points, a lot of accountability changes, a lot of reliability changes, a lot of traceability <coughs> issues. Okay. We at Bon Vivant believe that this is a problem. And how we're going to solve that is through technology and IoT blockchain. Okay. We're going to let you know exactly where your food is coming from, what the time it took to get there was, what conditions it traveled in, as well as the product that you want and are paying for is the one that you're actually going to get. Okay? What is that going to look to you as the individual? It's going to come in the form of a smartphone app. It means when you go to Costco or wherever you shop, you're going to go up. Let's just take a meat cooler, for example. And you're going to go up, and you're going to see our sensor on, the, on your package. And all you're going to have to do is go like this, and you're going to get real-time data. Okay? And Dan is just going to take over for me okay. and talk about our infrastructure. Thank you so much, guys. All right. So as part of uh, investigating how we're going to figure out this humongous task of tracking information from the farm all the way to the table, we looked at different things. We thought about creating our own infrastructure, but in a project this size, or even if it was a full-fledged company, it's a daunting task. So what we decided to do was to uh, pair up with somebody who has just recently started working in this field, but at least has a footprint. So what we decided to do is we, we wanted to come up with a solution with IBM Food Trust, which is a blockchain-based tracking mechanism <coughs> all the way from farm to the table. And we, uh, uh, we will tag along with them and kind of provide the consumer part of that information. So right now IBM is in, in the process of implementing this for big, big retail chains like Walmarts and Kroger's and so on. And we go from Kroger's and so on to the consumer. So, uh, I, so as, as I mentioned, IBM is, is launching, has launched a blockchain-based, permission blockchain-based uh, solution to track your food. And, you, and they have a cloud infrastructure that they, that they have available that we're gonna be tagging along with. And our part is we're installing the sensors on the food and tracking it and providing that information to the consumer. In addition to additional things like, uh, you know, uh, tracking the behave buying behavior, uh, looking at providing them loyalty programs and so on. So if you look at our traditional food chain, uh, a lot of it is a very <coughs> linear process where a lot of people depend on each other, word of mouth, and there's a lot of delays along this path uh, as the food goes from farm all the way down to the consumer. By moving to blockchain, what happens is everybody on that chain who is the permission has the ability to know where things are. So as soon as that cow goes to the slaughterhouse, 
everybody on that chain knows when it's going to be available to go. Logistics people can, ahead of time, um, uh, they can um, you know, make adjustments or make plans to handle that kind of load that may be coming in, right? So imagine, I mean, most of the time we are like Thanksgiving time, people are already aware there's a big food thing going on, but what happens if this happens in the middle of April, right? That kind of thing. So as you go along that chain, everybody has information about where the uh, product has been, and they, they have to approve that uh, transaction so that it can move forward. So everybody has a contract, virtual contract, they have to fulfill it, and then it moves on. You cannot, somebody cannot jump in and substitute your, uh, your product with something else. Moving on, this is kind of a visual representation of the same thing uh, to kind of help show you that. So basically you have farm, the cows, so if we talk about organic, let's say today, how do you know your, the beef that you're eating is organic? We don't, right? So here, what happens is when you go to the farm and that cow from its birth essentially will be tracked. What medicine, what antibiotics it got, what kind of feed it got, that information is transferred at each of these points and is tracked all the way through to the consumer. You can track whether the, the, the cow was slaughtered in Oregon or California, whether the processing plant had recalls in the past or not, and so on. So you as a consumer can then make that decision, like for example, Matt, he may not want to touch something that is two day old at the retailer, right? Okay, so in terms of our solution, we, we, what we are creating is a sensor that will basically attach to the food package uh, and basically will travel with it uh, and measure and record all the temperature, the humidity, uh, the, the location, and so on. Uh, we kind of based it Similar, uh, similar design to uh, a smartwatch, if you can think about it. We used s similar cost analysis and similar sensors, okay? Uh, in addition, the, the sensors will transmit information through a, to a hub, which will then link it up to the cloud, <coughs> okay? Uh, so if, uh, if you can click on the, on the picture. <coughs> so this is kind of a picture I took from Costco to kind of represent how a product will look. Uh, and you can see, basically, we'll have sensors attached to the products that we're interested in, which will then transmit information um, via our hub to the, through Wi-Fi or through direct through cellular into the cloud, when it will be available real time to the customer. Okay. That in terms of our linkage, we, I kind of took something. Some people would recognize this already. The we took, we want to set it up in such a way uh, that we have sensors connecting to uh, our hub, which is then connecting to the cloud. Uh, IDT would be one of our partners anyways in developing some of that hardware, so I just got that off there. Uh, sorry. Uh, Hold on, let me go back to that. I apologize. It's okay. Sorry, Danish. That's no, okay. Okay, here we go. So software-wise, software-wise, uh, we will have an app which will then provide that information live to the consumer. It would be uh, a subscription-based app. Um, you would be able to track your uh, food data, uh, food, uh, I mean, your food uh, statistics, metrics, reliability, end-to-end, -end, and then we would, also, we would also have the app upload some of the buying behavior and stuff back into the cloud. Uh, in addition, you would have the customers would have loyalty programs. They would have discounts that we can then uh, use as a way of attracting more customers to the vendors that we are working with. And uh, if I, and we wanted to make it a one-stop shop, so you would also be able to get information about recalls that have been happening and so on, uh, because sometimes it takes a while for those recall information to get out. Here you have everything coming to you uh, fairly quickly. So uh, in summary, basically this is the the whole supply chain kind of laid out in a way so that you can visualize what's going on. So from supplier all the way to the consumer, you have RFIDs, you have uh, sensors, you have QR codes that are all being used to track every step where your food has been and then present it to you in that app form. Okay, so I'm gonna hand off to Valerie. Do you want me to drive? 
Um, so I'm going to talk about the business side, and basically we're going to talk about um, who our customers are going to be. So our, our niche market, market. Um, and they're mostly initially going to be high-end meat connoisseurs. So people who like to eat wagyu, um, filet mignon, ribeye, New York strip, um, tenderloin, um, and the overall beef market's about $26 billion, and we're only going to take Right now, the USDA prime, which is the highest level, take um, that's a 3% market, so that's about $5.5 billion. And in the past 10 years, that market has doubled. It used to be about 1.5% to 2% of the market. So, um, and there's actually um, future growth opportunity there, so. Um, our go-to market strategy, so our avenues that we're gonna pursue or going to be on the business to business side, retailers and restaurants, um, um, hotels, places like steakhouses. I don't know if you guys are aware of Alexander's Steakhouse in the Bay Area. They have Cooper, they have a chain, um, which they have one in Cupertino, another in San Francisco. So um, speaking of Wagyu back earlier, um, Kobe beef is like, you know, the probably the highest price of the, the Wagyu market. And um, if you can want to go in there, you can buy a three ounce um, Kobe beef steak with a side of potatoes for like $215. And so um, that's an example. And there's only one of the restaurants in the country that will sell you Kobe beef um, at a steakhouse. So, yeah, legitimate. Um, yeah, we won't go into the long story, but years back, everybody was saying they had Kobe beef. So, um, and then there was the disease, and you know, but that was back in 2010. That's all under control again. Um, also, we have business to consumer, so individuals purchasing the fine meats, and then we have infrastructure partners that um, did Donish um, alluded to earlier, IBM for their blockchain, IDT for their hardware and um, our customer partners. So initially we're gonna you know, use as our beta customers also um, our Omaha Steaks and Dean DeLuca for their online um, retail. And then of course Costco. Who doesn't, you know, who hasn't heard of Costco or, or even love Costco? Actually going back to the Wagyu beef, and Kobe's the, the, best cut, um, the, the best part of that, but at Costco on Monday there was a coupon it just ended on Monday, so sorry, I'm a little late on this, but there was um, $1,000 for a 12-pound um, Wagyu rib roast. So that's a steal compared to the 215 bucks. <laughs> you just have to cook it yourself. And then finally, your friends, your very <laughs> friends you want to impress. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so there's that um, um, And also our competition. Um, we have a few in, in the space. Not doing exactly the same thing, but um, crowd cow is basically crowdfunding a cow. S but they don't utilize sensors in their process, and they only sell to wholesale consumers. And Bob bon Devant Sensor Pack and Hub will actually attach the sensors to the product and ensure quality, and it'll sell to a broader market base or customer base. So it goes to the end consumer also. We have a few in the space too. They don't exactly do the same thing. Canama meats. Um, let's see. Oh, they're a distributor that goes from um, the purchase to the delivery, and then Clear Labs also. I um, let's see. Okay, so shift it <coughs> Clear Labs. Oh, there's another that's supposed to be on here. De Debraga. Sorry, that's not on here. Uh, oh, no, no, it, it is. is. Oh, okay, yeah. sorry. Yeah, I'm <laughs> nervous. Um, that's a New York butcher that also delivers, and it usually does it overnight. Clear Labs is a, a genomics firm, so they're testing the food. And AgShift um, is working on some deep, some deep learning um, procedure. So not exactly, but so we're kind of focusing crowd cow here. Um, and now we're going to go to the financial side of it, um, the costs and the break-even analysis. So basically, oops, I'm jumping the gun a little bit. Um, with our costs, um, obviously they're going to be a little higher in the beginning because we we're investing in hardware research and development. Um, so, and, and our, some of our assumptions are obviously based on like a thousand in quantity to get price breaks, 
hoping we use the sum of thousand. But here's some of the costs. Sensor pack costs twenty one dollars per sensor. Sensor hub eight cents per sensor if you go by unit. Um, service cost seventy six cents. Um, and also on the break even analysis. So big picture, we're looking. Um, we're basically making assumptions here to to look at this, but. Um, the costs and the revenue from 2019 and 2021 are going to go up, but around three or four years down the road, we'll actually break even. It will be 21.5 billion versus 22.5 billion in revenue. So, um, also, um, actually, Matt here is yeah. going to speak a little bit more about the revenue drivers. Uh, I'm going to go back to sorry. this. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I thought I. Did I'm going to go back to this slide really quick and talk about actually um, in the next year. I should say, is this is the cost of about 100,000 sensors. And by the end of 2021, that's about a million sensors right there. Okay. So just to give you an estimate of what you're looking at. Here. Okay. So this is the exciting part. I know I kind of scared you guys in the beginning, but I actually um, am excited to go through this. So this is where we start making money. And there's four points that we're going to start making revenue. The first point is through that app subscription which is gonna be offered to individuals and hopefully to a very broad audience once we start making more and more sensors. We're then gonna have targeted advertising. Again, using machine learning and also learning people's buying habits too. We're gonna to then be able to sell that back to the retailer. Also kind of interesting, and I didn't even think about this until we started working on this. Say for example, I am a meat shipping company and I go from Atlanta all the way to California, and it takes me 16 hours or however many days it takes to get there. Um, and I think I'm shipping my meat at, let's say, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And then I get there, and I notice that on the way, it fluctuated between 45 and 54 degrees. That's telling me something's wrong with my hardware, or that I made a mistake in the calculations of how I adjusted my freezer. So interesting, it gives you, or it gives the retailers hardware feedback too, which is kind of cool. And then this is Steven's favorite point here. This is data as a service. People, data is the future. This is, the, this is again, where we're gonna make the most amount of money because we're now getting people's buying habits and patterns and being able to sell that back to whoever's interested in it. And then this is our roadmap. Dan is going to take back over. So we started this project, and we explored a lot of different things. Stephen can vouch for how many <laughs> times this thing has changed. Most of the people we talked about had eight weeks. We did it in two. <laughs> so, But uh, the thing is that we were very interested in figuring out what can we do with technology to help hum human beings and in medical or the health of the person, right? So we started off looking into uh, volatile compounds and see how they, we can detect certain things. Um, so we kind of kept that big picture still, and for now what we're doing is we're releasing our product in a bunch of steps. And what you see here is over a period of time, we're gonna be releasing our product with different functionality. So right now what we're expecting is we're gonna do a beta in the spring, in the three months, go out to the customers, uh, let them put the product on, let's see what data we get. And based on that data, we will be, uh, we will be introducing new features in, for data analytics, for recall information, and kind of roll all of that into a release product somewhere in fall of 2019. Again, the, that's, we're still, we're continuously learning, we're getting continuous amount of, I mean, data, so we're continuously developing new features like the VOC sensor, machine learning, uh, eventually even going to uh, have this product available for the home consumer so that you can go to your fridge and say, hey, is that meat has been in there for three weeks, should I eat it? Right? That kind of stuff. And um, eventually what we want to do is roll out, uh, roll out product that would be able to test how much the bacteria concentration uh, in your food may be, which, could be another, which would be a better predictor of not just volatile compounds and temperature, but be a better predictor of is your food good or bad? Okay, so that's what this looks like. I think that's the end of our slides. Mm -hmm. And Thank project. you. Any questions?
a little reference to SpongeBob. Mark can vouch for yeah. that. <laughs> we had the, the, the guy pass away, so we kind of just put that up there. Yeah. Well, yeah, you guys did a fantastic job. Very good idea. I think technically there's a, a question regarding the battery because the traveling time from through the supply chain can be a week, can be months, we don't know, depending on the product. But if you're going to have a wireless Bluetooth and also sensor on, on that package, it kind of has to look at the battery. Can we let the battery last longer enough to support you guys? Right. Number two is uh, the data process. Because uh, through the long process, you have a lot of data actually pumping into the server or maybe clocked. But what is really meaningful the data is the temperature range or humidity range is outside your specification. You can really identify the product has a problem during that time frame. Otherwise, you should ignore or whatever kind of drop off those data. You want to minimize your data processing. And uh, then to the customer side and uh, to the manufacturer, all the retainer is different. We don't have time to track all the detail where the part the, the, the beef actually stops somewhere. But we're more interested with this with the certain time period. There's a problem with the temperature contamination or something, and they kind of make a warning to the consumer side. But retainer is different. They have to track in all the detail. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I, I think we should look at how to process data, yes. how should have it long enough to get the battery support. Yes, I, I think that would be a big learning thing that you have to do because I think we're way, I, I would say, in the infancy of our, even our, even our own project. I mean, having that, just the amount of data, uh, just sim doing a simple calculation, we, we said even if we were to take a 15 minute sample, you know, every sample every 15 minutes, we're generating gigs of data per sensor. Yeah. And what if this goes really well and we have 500 million sensors out there, then what do we do? Right, so those are things we have to learn, and unfortunately, right now we don't have that kind of detail. So it's a it's a learning thing that we'll do. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, that's a great idea. I'm surprised it doesn't already exist. But, uh, Thank you. But, uh, it, it is there I, in a way. It, it's getting there. It's a time that we have to discuss this in our focus. But you did talk about you kind of recycling the sensors after it's been that's, used. That's correct. That's a great. You talk about hundred thousand and million units. Yes. That's, there's got to be quite a bit of you know. Yeah. Yes, do you want to answer that? Yeah, we actually, uh, we do plan to recycle. In fact, part of our packaging design is such, kind of like as you see on electronics, where you have a, a big circular tie and then you have the tie wraps. So when they get, get out of the checkout counter, we expect that we would take it back and then reprocess it. We still don't have all the process laid out, but we, we don't want to throw these away. These are way too expensive uh, and our cost would be very high, right? Because we're just providing a service. The hardware is kind of our, investment so yeah. and we, want, yeah. we, we want to minimize it as much as we can. No, and that's, a, that's a really good point and that's actually um, an area that we spent a lot of time in uh, trying to come up with a form fitted like what, what is the ideal one to go onto a package you know and it just depends on the package itself but again we don't want to throw it away and if you have something that is piercing into a package too how are you going to seal it afterwards and stuff like that? So again, that's still complications that we're dealing with and kind of coming up with a better solution. So, in the interest of time, I know you you have a show and tell that you maybe a minute. A minute. Yeah. drinking water. So people are Americas, Americans, the research was made here in the USA, are really concerned about the drinking water. And it's even over above the pollution rivers and the air pollution, global warming, and also other research were made 
and then they noted that as the water system age, 63% uh, 63 of Americans are now concerned about their drinking water. <laughs> So why do we have that? Why why are we worried about it? The problem is uh, the water leaves the the water company uh, safe for drinking. It's a pot potable water, but uh, uh, the way uh, between the water company and our house, it's it happens a lot of uh, contaminants can get in the water, so and how, how they can get in our water. So those contaminants come from uh, pesticides, animals, animal waste, and sewage, and some people also flush their uh, medicines, so that uh, unfortunately affect our water quality. Uh, in fact, the the poor water quality has a, a, a has a uh, high um, impact on our on our on the water quantity in a number of ways. Polluted water that cannot be used for drinking or for um, agriculture and for bathing, and it can reduce the amount of uh, water, so it also affects the water in, in a quantity way. Uh, the contaminants that we can see on your, we can, uh, we can have on your uh, drinking water are microbial, inorganic pesticides, and herbicides, organic chemicals, and radio radioactive. And those contaminants can cause uh, several pro health problems, like cancer, gastrointestinal disease, and developmental delays in children. And also, <laughs> even if you use a, a water bottle, you drink from the water bottle, or you have um, your own um, treatment at your home, like filter, um, some people, some vulnerable, vulnerable groups, so uh, like the ones that, that um, pass by, uh, has chemotherapy, HIV, AIDS, or other immune disorders, organ transplants, and some elderly and infants can, can also have severe problems if they drinking the water we drink but it's health for us, no, it's safe for us, but it's unsafe for them. And also here I have a, a map of California, and it shows um, uh, the distribution of all, all of the contaminants in, in, in the state. So in, your, in the area you can see that we have a, a high amount of pesticides and nutrients. What's very, uh, which can, what which can cause cancer, gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal, gastro sorry, intestinal disease. So we have a we found a solution for that problem. Uh, what we can do uh, is analyze our water and we can make sure that we are, the water we are drinking is safe. So we developed a device that can give us alerts, alerts, uh, uh, daily alerts about our water drinking, and also can display tips and how um, uh, tips, uh, if you find, I'm sorry, um, uh, with the alerts that this, the, the display shows, shows the consumer, 
it's also going to show which kind of contaminants your, water, your drinking water has. So you also are going to be able to treat by yourself the water you are drinking or find a right, a right, right way to treat or buying a water bottle or using a filter or even boiling your water. And also the other uh, feature is addressing. We are going to be able to address all the uh, water contaminants and all the houses that um, has uh, that has uh, drinking water uh, polluted. So it, it's going to uh, give us a big data about regions, areas, and also it's going to be very useful for the water company in the city. Other benefits is that uh, in our device we also are going to have us uh, instead of the we're going to have a water quality sensor and <coughs> also a flow sensor with, which is going to give us the the analysis of your of leakage leaking in our toilet tank. That's where we're gonna install your device, and we're gonna talk more about that soon. Um, our go to okay. Our go to market strategy. <coughs> so why the toilet tank? You guys are probably wondering what came up with this idea. Uh, so, I was throwing them out there just left and right, and I had, and of all of them, we got the toilet one. So, it was coming from how we could keep our water quality uh, monitored and, and have that uh, just so that, uh, I guess I don't know what I'm saying right now, but it's the toilet right in the tank, and we put it right, I, I know what I'm saying. This, I had a next door customer, cause, excuse me. They called me up and they said, uh, my toilet's leaking. And uh, I'm at City College, I'm working, I'm doing, you know, construction technology, so I have this handyman business. I go out there and I lift up the toilet and I fix the toilet for it. Bring that up uh, over here. Marissa wasn't there that day, so I was trying to go towards something else, but the toilet idea is just stuck. And I was like, come on, we gotta think of something else, because the toilet is just like, nobody's gonna <laughs> But we ended up making it work, and I think that, um, to say the least, uh, it's it's just it's inconce it's inconspicuous, right? And it's uh, a way of powering itself. With the there's a device that, when the toilet flush, the water flows, creates energy, 3.5 volts, powers up the Adreno, sends the data, and uh, that's that's what we're looking at. Create a market, the power of the water, pretty much. And net zero is our goal. That's as far as our, our uh, it's kind of leaning towards health, but bringing back towards the environment, mental, which is our focus, is to have a zero energy home and try and keep the water quality circulating within itself, put it back in the ground maybe, and bring it back to the well, if not, and eventually, you know, be self sustainable. And the go to market strategy, the, uh, in the part for business to business, we are gonna sell offer for the water company. Um, so the water company is gonna be able to realize if the uh, water is contaminated before it gets to the consumer. So it's gonna be very useful for them. And also in business to consumer, uh, we are gonna sell um, directly for, to the tap water and well consumers. So they can, also the well consumers, they are not, they have to analyze their own water so the government doesn't do that for them. So that's gonna be useful for them too. <laughs> uh, our partnership's gonna be IDT on the development of the same water quality center, San Jose Water, that's the comp water company, and AWS. Uh, our goals are 
Yeah, so the, our goal is to have the cost minimal. We will go into a little bit of details about the device, what we have. It may sound a little silly that we are dealing with a water tank, but it's not. And the water quality, really, so far, there is no uh, functional or operational water quality sensor in the market that really works, which is electronic. Whatever we did, a lot of research and found out everything was chemical based. Or it is like doing some bacteria culture or a whole bunch of chemical testing. It's just a, like a long process. So we are proposing to make something electronic. And uh, so far, we understand that there are like pH testing and um, uh, lucidity of water and things like um, salinity, these kind of things can be tested electronically. And we do believe, our device believes that the little IoT FS3102 has all that capability in it. So <laughs> if it doesn't have it today, we'll make it happen. <laughs> so that is the one, that little device, though it looks little, it has like value proposition is priceless, basically priceless. But we are, we can't sell it for nothing. Our cost of making is like some cost we think we will be having, and we can sell it for 199. <coughs> we have profit of 155. However, this this 199 will come back to you very quickly to the consumers very quickly. We'll go through that um, because <coughs> the water leak that we are having in general is tremendous. We have some data we will show you when we are trying to hook up our prototype, which is somehow latching to some other 6W uh, lower fan. Uh, it's latching to something else, but we will show you the data. Um, we can go a little bit ahead here right now, and then we'll show you the data. But our companies definitely, we will have, our competitions are like, uh, if you send it to a water company for water quality detection, it takes for a very long time. You don't have a real time data. Yeah. And yeah, and um, if we have a leak that is undetected, it takes like very long time and you don't even detect the leak. You'll see the US data that how bad it is with these problems. We will have that on the site, in situ and impromptu decisions and a product that saves you health as well as your money. Then it's very convenient because it will be sitting on just on the, in the back of a toilet tank, you don't even see it. By the way, the toilet tank water, you, you might be thinking it's a dirty water, but it's exactly the same water that you drink. It comes in the same pipeline. It's not your garden hose water. That's different, but the toilet tank water is the same thing that you drink. So, <laughs> ridiculous, but that's true. So we, we do have in situ and in practice solution. Then uh, we are doing it at home. The life of the device will be long. Um, we don't expect it to be changing every year or so. You'll have at least five to 10 years of lifetime. These won't erode or go bad easily. So we, we will have a very strong, we believe we'll have a very strong market share. And we will have something that everybody needs. It's, uh, we don't want to have, 80% of the health issues in the world are only because of the water quality problem. 80% of people are sick. So your hospital bills, your medical bills, your insurance cost, all of that is because of that quality. If you knew that this water is not something I should be drinking, probably you won't, and you'll save yourself all that trouble. At the same time, the reason we are asked putting this that leak detector, because that leak, leak, little leak detection, you're thinking it's a little thing, but it is kind of 10% of your water. In the US statistics, as per Environmental Protection Agency, is that 10% of water waste water is wasted through <coughs> toilet tanks. <laughs> so 400 trillion water in the US every year is wasted through toilet tanks because they leak. And um, the cost will be, if it is medium to uh, no leak to moderate to high leak, you will be saving kind of $50 per month of your money. 
because of this water leak. So your money comes back really quickly with $199. Please buy it. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we are trying to hook this up. We'll show you some little device things that if you can. Is it still? Restart? Okay, we can do this. Now, did you want to go and take a look at their IoT device and ask questions in? Does that, that make more sense? Or you want to ask questions from your seats? I know you have wireless power up on um, uh, your, your cost analysis. So how are you using the wireless power? We are coming to that. This is toilet tank. This doesn't have, this has a kind of, here is your flush. Every time you flush, you need to refill your water. It takes water out and it flows water in back again. So, Now you might be thinking that it's weird, but let's see. Home water, what we are thinking, this is how our device is. Uh, this, uh, it is basically this little thing is having all the feature functionality. And we are using the IPv6 wireless uh, low power personal area network device from you, which hoping that all of this can be integrated and this will not be dipping inside the toilet tank. Um, so what we will do, we, have, we are showing that if there is basically no bad quality of water, there will be one electrode, electrode dipping in, which will be encased, but other parts will be up, which you can, we'll show you how it works. But when the, there is a water leak, when the water flows through this, of course you know all these graphs that humidity flows, humidity goes, uh, um, changes, and then the flow changes. So as the flow level changes quite a bit, you see that what happens to your water quality, what happens. So basically take away. Yeah, if we go back to the previous one. You can see that if, usually the uh, contaminant level is very high in this area, San Jose specifically, because we have very, very old water pipes which have a lot of lead in it. Galvanized, they're not, I would say lead, but sediment, all that sediment, and that's building up in your water heater, and it, it, a lot of water heaters go out because it's just filled up with sediment, and it just, the light will just turn off, and I've had a couple of them had go out there and replace. But yeah. you're saying the lead in the water is, is definitely an issue, I just don't think that, that's like a and and mercury nearby. Point. We have mercury spills yes, just a yes. mile from here. Quicksilver. It's uh, it's a whole bunch of problems, or, or the pesticides in the water because it flows through the water. Sure. Yeah, uh, I think I would like to give a brief uh, comment. Number one sure. is uh, what good idea and to save our earth and save our environment. Uh, but basically, I think there are two topics combined together, so somehow I kind of feel a little bit confusing. Once you're talking about uh, contamination, you know, water quality, and then there's the, the leaking detector type. So I think the majority here, the idea of business is look at the, how to detect the leaking and uh, for the toilet or whatever the system inside the house. Maybe we should have a little bit of clarification. Sure, that's okay. a very, very good point. Okay. Basically, the reason we are trying to, uh, do you want to ask more before? Yeah, so. Uh, number two is more kind of the technical side. Uh, I think that during a normal operation, if I flush my toilet, you don't want to get a warning because this is a kind of normal leaking. It's now normal yes. leaking, right? So what is the criteria? You know this is now the normal operation. It's probably less than 10 minutes or five minutes or more than two minutes of stretcher is set, then your sensor will notify your hub and, uh, and telling the owner that you have water leak and have to stop that. And secondly, I think the idea you can further extend to not only the toilet or maybe refrigerator. And I had the refrigerator got leaking, caused a big problem. I, I have to spend the disaster, you know, handling and uh, to fix the floor, all this stuff. How to detect the water, you know, right back to the wall uh, uh, on the refrigerator side, 
and also sprinkler system. And uh, in the backyard and uh, in the, during the day, if something happened, you can really notify the owner and uh, stop it uh, leaking. I think those kind of idea kind of share with, uh, with, with some of you. Excellent, excellent points. And uh, given the time, we have thought through some of them. We haven't thought through all of them. Uh, we had, uh, we wish it, this class was going on for one year. <laughs> and we had a lot of time to think and create. Uh, but, but some of the questions we certainly can handle. So uh, first thing that these seem to be two disconnect things, water quality and then a water leak detection. True, water quality sometimes you may say, oh, I'm not going to drink water from the tap. I don't drink it. I just use the bottled water. So people may say, oh, I'm not going to buy it. I, I don't care for it. If they may not be able to see through the immediately that what saving it does to them because it, the saving is behind. Or sometimes people are pressed by money not to spend $199. So that to uh, give them incentive, basically, please buy it, is the leak part. So when we combine multiple capabilities, it becomes like you are serving so much more than one problem that you people, you're compelling. This is a compelling thing for people to buy it. That's why we are combining. We could uh, sell separate products, that's fine. But if we have more features into it that we thought, that if we have more features, if we can show you here, you recover your price, your cost, in so quickly because you are bound to have a water leak in your toilet tank in less than 10 years before your device fails. Yeah. And in the meantime, you definitely are going to recover your price. So that was the idea behind that we combined these two, that okay, we are going to put both of them together. First of all, I think is that you're still with us. Uh, we really uh, we enjoyed the presentation of our colleagues. It was really excited, and I hope you still have a little bit of your patience and time to look on our presentation. But before we start, I would like to grab 40 seconds of your time. Just before we started, has everyone seen children? Just to be on the same page. Yeah, we know how we look. Let's use 40 seconds just to describe what is it, child, how it behave, what it can be. And probably I will start with, um, they can be bright, fast, fascinated. Would someone edit something? Loud. Upset. Loud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Upset. What else? Innocent. Innocent, yeah. Wait, what children are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> His kids are <laughs> What else? Probably they can be super happy, super excited. They cannot defend themselves as well. And this small time that we use just a 40 seconds to describe such a new, absolutely new creature. But what I can add to these nice words as I described only is mist. Every 40 seconds in US, one child is missed. So that's why I would like to start our presentation about such important topic as protection our children our children today we will talking about child location tracking and uh, the reason why we decided to care about this topic because it's really important and almost every one of us has someone who is small and need to have extra care. And uh, I don't want to scare you, but I just want to show you some of the statistics um, that almost half a million children, 460,000 missing every year. And about 1,500 children were kidnapped and in 2016, there were 1, 000, uh, 179 Amber Alerts, which is mean, uh, which involved 231 child, which is mean that it's a really high risk that child will be injured or probably die. And if we ta talk about our age range, uh, so our location, child location tracking will be oriented for 
kindergartens and daycares. And if we look on the representation, so year from zero to two, it's 21% from missing kids, children, and three to five years, it's 23. If we combine them together, it's 44%, which is almost a half. What's really scary part, it's exactly the age where children cannot protect themselves. Well, doesn't matter what you tell them, what you explain them, they still do not have perception of this world. And what we can rely on, it's on our technology and on us. Why it's important to protect children, if I should still t tell about that. First of all, uh, by Maslow Pyramid, safety is one of the basic needs. And safety of the next generation, of our new, next, like, new future, everything is one of the biggest priority for us. And to protect children is our responsibility as an adult and as the people who have better understanding what life is it is. But before I will dig into the, our project and how we want to protect, I would like to present my amazing team I was working with. Uh, it's uh, Sitla Lin. Uh, she is really involved in cybersecurity and uh, cloud connection. So that's the reason why we have clouds and server side. As well, Matthew, who was really amazing in find a way, who can be our customers, how we can grow in the future, and how much money we can earn as well. And Olga, it's me. Um, I was the person who was putting all these pieces together and uh, tried to find the right technology to be able to make this goal real. And I'm interested in web application what, and mobile devices application, which mean our, um, our device will have as well representation in web and mobile applications. So let's talk about the product and how we wanna solve this. It's this thing in the pictures, it's a really small button, which will be connected to the child it's really safe because it has a special lock, so the child cannot be able to take it off. And the uh, materials which we're using is uh, no provoking, not provoking allergy, and so it's waterproof because we know they sometimes clumsy, you know, drinking water, something spilling. And um, security, as I said, we want to work with the data which will be on the server side. So all the location will be calculated on the server side. Nothing will be on the client side which make um, it's more data safer. No one else will know where's your kid. Only the nanny or a teacher and you as a parent. And um, we're using um, precise tracking, triangulation system, which just means that we have, we'll talk later a little bit more detail about that. So we have three points and we measure the distance between them to know exactly precise where is uh, our the child or you know, our device. And um, the system which we use, it's called Beacon. Um, they have wide range, it's a low energy Bluetooth. Uh, they have real, now really wide range, it can be till 450 meters. And what's a really good advantage of that, they do not consume a lot of energy, that's why it's low energy and you don't need, and any um, teacher doesn't need to like, charge every night when children is going out from the kindergarten. It will last uh, from one to three years. It depends how often you will send the signal from that device. And basically how it looks, what else? it will have the option to turn off and turn on. For example, if it's a uh, weekend, they don't need it, so they can turn on and turn off, and uh, it has a special lock, which just means if you apply on the right side, you can see, can be adjusted to any pieces of clothes, and the special lock will not um, give it just to fall somewhere, or just someone grab, because we know the real, uh, children usually are really active, and we need the safety that can, they cannot swallow it, or just lose it. And now we will talk about, um, technique, how it works. So we want to present a one set which will have instead of three nodes, we're planning five nodes 
they sometimes called bridges, gates, trackers. Uh, why we decided to go for five? Because children is really important, we don't want to miss any spot. Usually they placed in three places and just calculate the area between just the track. But we thought five would be the optimal because if it's a room, we can put in each corner and in the middle one just to cover each area so that we're not missing anything. And each of the um, child will have a beacon which will be adjusted to the um, clothes. And when they're moving, all this information tracked sent to the server side where will be calculated the area and after that teacher or you as a parent like just to have a break and say hey okay it's a kindergarten it's like it's in the right place I can say oh uh, continue working I can like not worry where is my kid and it's how it will work and uh, the application can be that panel can be for example in the room of teachers and as well it can be a mobile application which can be presented by parents just to give them safe time during the work. <laughs> and yes, they will be um, like located where they are. It can be outside or inside, so indoor and outdoor. <coughs> and a little bit more what we're using. On the left, on the right side, you can see um, our gateway or not. Uh, we need just usual supply. It can use Wi-Fi network um, and basically <coughs> you can put them in the room. And the beacon, it's the size of um, a little bit bigger as a coin. Uh, the battery is replaceable. It's really simple coin battery <coughs> and uh, it uh, lasts really long, like one, two years, one, three years. Sometimes they say even two, five, but it's really, if you're not really often send the signal. That is the reason that children are really fast and sometimes disappear really fast. We decided better to, to be on a safe side, so uh, we assume in like one, two years, because we want to send a signal like 100 milliseconds and back, so it's probably not so. <laughs> okay, you will correct me later. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we want to use Android, iOS, and web application, which provides um, accessibility for parents and um, teachers or nannies to track where it's child now. And about money part and how it works, how much it costs, I would introduce Mickey. He will continue. Thank you. That was great. Um, hi. <laughs> so as far as payment options, um, we're thinking of doing a subscription plan. So either monthly or yearly. Uh, a monthly would be about twenty dollars a year or twenty dollars a month. Um, and what that would make room for is for like people that um, have students that or kids that uh, have summer vacation, winter vacation. You know, uh, this will only be applied to schools. So, if you don't want to be paying for certain months, if you want to take your kid on a vacation to, you know, or, or they're out sick and you don't want to make that payment, you know, you're welcome to opt out um, at any month. Or um, the other option is to do 200 a year, uh, flat rate, and that's for people that uh, maybe have to leave their kids in a daycare all year round, or um, kids are overachievers and, and want to go to summer school or or a winter session, and like they, we can have that kind of protection for them all the time, all the time. Um, what we don't do is is put the responsibility of payment on these schools. We want to drive home that the uh, the safety of our children, the safety of our, our you know youngest generation, is at the top of our priorities. So uh, so we will be kind of giving out the the beacons themselves for. Uh, for free to the schools to kind of cement our our uh, our hold on on uh, the hearts and minds of <laughs> families in, in the states. Um, if you want to hit next, please. Um, as far as cost and income, so the cost of the uh, Beacon Gateway will be thirty one fifty, and it would look about five per per like setup. Uh, we'll have the mini plugs. We'll have uh, batteries for each each beacon. Uh, we'll have the uh, actual beacon, and we'll have packaging. Cloud server will be fifty two a month. Um, labor installation thirty, probably a lot more than that, honestly. <laughs> but, 
Um, so ultimately, um, our monthly subs, if everyone did monthly, um, would be 4,800 for a classroom of 20. Uh, making our profit for that classroom about 3.5 thousand. And then if we did a year sub for each person in the, in the classroom, it'd be about uh, 4,000 total, profit being uh, 2,700. Um, but that's kind of lowballing it because we also recognize that a lot of schools have more than one kindergarten classroom. Um, so, you know, there'd be fewer, uh, fewer free beacons handed out and more uh, subscriptions. Um, as far as our customer base, um, we figure any kind of modern age parent would want to want to partake just because, you know, we have this huge market for like smart homes now, why don't we have a market for smarter schools? Um, and I know like, you know, people at home have their Alexas, I think you have an Alexa, uh, Google Homes, iHomes now. Uh, and so like you can, go, you can go home, you can like connect to your home devices, you can connect to your camera, your nests. Um, to like check on the, the well-being of your home, why don't you want that for your children as well? Um, our primary demographic will be uh, parents, guardians who you know want a little more security for their children, want peace of mind when they leave ch their children uh, in the care of another. Um, the number of children in pre-K or pre-primary school, so the kindergarten and daycares has been um, pretty stagnant as of like the 2000s. It's been around about like 8.5 million students uh, or kids in those kind of care centers. Um, and, it's, and so the market is like pretty big. Um, but that does not include, so sorry, in 2001 there were 92,858 elementary schools, um, public and private. But that number also does not include um, daycares because daycare is a little hard to keep track of. There's more. Um, there's more kind of private home daycares uh, in addition to the public and private, like larger institutions. And then as far as um, how we want to market it, we think we'd have like a spokesperson, spokesperson go to different daytime talk shows where the demographic is uh, stay-at-home parents, people that are, are um, devoting a lot of their time and energy into taking care of their children that would want to have this extra like peace of mind. And next, uh, I'll introduce Sitlin for the uh, presentation. So while looking for like the competition, we really didn't see it much for the child care children uh, tracking system. We saw some watches, but that didn't really go for what we wanted. Um, we did find a Bluetooth, Bluetooth beacon tracking starter kit, which was 4500 which is quite a lot of money for just 20 beacons. And they, the beacon only has a one year battery life. And then I also found the Find My Scout, which is kind of more similar to what we want to do with the monthly payments. Uh, but the parent has to buy the, the Scout so they can uh, actually use it. We want to do, but why are we better? Well, we are half the price of the starter kit. And we are, um, we are going to be uh, secure, look, uh, secure because we will be going through the cloud server where parents can easily look at through their phone and check where their child is. Also like uh, the, the instructor or the child, uh, the child taker, they'll be able to see track each child through the computer and through their system. And also we have a longer battery life than the other, than the, the Scout because the Scout it's only three days and we have to charge it, it gets boring, charge, charge. And so this one it's, you just use a battery of one, through, one to three years and it's a lot easier, you don't have to worry about the battery life. The, also the beacon position, while the other two you would keep them inside your pocket or inside a backpack, kids lose their backpacks, they lose them all the time. So why not put, put a clip on their, on their clothes, on their shoe, that way they're always, they always have it on them. Now, um, we mostly would work with uh, child care centers or schools, and while the parents just have to focus with the subscription, uh, that way they don't have to worry about the whole of buying the extra equipment for each child. We could reuse that, that equipment for other child, children. Now, what our plan is to for a timeline is like we would do two months to 
focus on the, the programming aspects and creating the clips. And then afterwards, um, the, uh, in, afterwards, we would start the cloud server. That way we can uh, um, see what we need, uh, so phone-wise and uh, computers. Um, and then afterwards, we would try to get uh, child care centers to try out our product and see how they like it for two weeks. And afterwards, uh, try to get a presence in the social media, such as like uh, The View and all those um, talk shows uh, that with parents. And then afterwards, we would try to fix the system again and try again to take it out there. A total, we would, our goal would be like around six months to just create the system and then afterwards like work with it more. Thank you so much for your attention. So you were able to see our location, child location tracking system. We, uh, this product, we're not selling the hardware, we're selling service. And with this service, we hope that each of us will be safer and calmer and we will know that our kids and our children in the right place in the right time. Thank you so much. I guess uh, it's a good idea, uh, but I'd like to throw some idea for you guys to think about. Okay. Right. Number one is, uh, well, it is a good to track inside the house, but for this case particularly, it's more like you want to know the kids is inside the house. Doesn't matter where he is or she is. It's matter. So position is not that important, but distance is more important. Maybe we don't need to buy a expensive position Bluetooth system. You know, with the other way, you can still track in the distance how far the kids is far away from like, you know, the house, and you can detect you know the kids inside the house or not. So it's going to significantly simplify the design and also the cost, because the overall it's kind of very expensive. Like, if you take an account that we will have like 20 children in a room, I mean, or average, what we found, it's like 21, 22, but we say, okay, let's say 15 or 20, and a big room, that's why we say we want a five uh, uh, nodes to be able to track. This, this um, system is really cheap, because the one beacon is approximately 10 bucks, which is nothing. And uh, the gateway system is 30, 35 bucks. The biggest part is um, server side, but if you take into account that each kindergarten has a couple of rooms, so the server side will be not assigned only for this room, it will be used by the whole kindergarten, probably a couple of them. So it will reduce the price. And about technologies that you say, we were uh, looking through many of them and we were looking for the rights for us, and we were checking like, um, like gateways, so we were checking uh, radio signals, and with all the prices included, this, this one is much cheaper. If we take into account how many children, our idea was exactly to track each child uh, to give understanding to the parents that not, you know, there is in a room 10 children. I'm like, okay, it's nice. I want to know why is in a room or not. Because I mean, I do care about children in general, but as a parent, I'm worried, is mine there? Is not somewhere aside? Is teacher not sleeping or uh, like playing in the games or something? I want to be sure that it's exactly this biking, exactly on this child. And this system allowed to track each biking has on the back side um, unique code, so you will know that it's your child. That's why. Yeah. So I'm just giving one example. If I use my what I was to track yeah. where my my iPhone is, I can basically, based on distance, I yes. know the iPhone is still nearby inside the house, right? because the distance is given by Bluetooth range, and beyond that range, your actual phone will be disabled, so you will not be able to track. That kind of gave you some idea. It's correct. That, and the kids still inside the house or not. Yeah, it's correct. Right. The problem so, is kids do not have mobile phones. you can phones. save the cost, I make hope. it simple. I mean, and, the problem is kids do not have mobile phones. And we hope they will not have to six. <laughs> it's too early. <laughs> but yeah, your idea is correct. We tra uh, we check in the distance from the knob to the icon, which is uh, which is basically Bluetooth. And we uh, uh, by this um, distance we know where is it. But our idea is not only check where is the distance, um, 
as I told, we, we want to use triangulation system, which just mean like from nodes to nodes will be sent it and we will be able to check where is it exactly. Because we thought probably in the future uh, we will take an account that can be not the one room, it can be a couple of rooms. Probably there is a space where you don't want your child who will enter or something like that. So that's why we thought with a future adjustment. <laughs> but yes, have, idea. have time for one more question. Thank you. Yeah. I, <laughs> just in case I have this stuff, can the child take that off? No. No. Quick answer, no. If uh, a little bit wider, we, uh, we were thinking about it. It's the biggest concern because we know they're really fast, they can swallow parts, and it's definitely not what we want. That's why it has secure lock. So basically, when you adjust, then you lock it, and the child cannot take it off. It's or like an adult take it off. Just, just adult, yes. So in, in that case, like, if someone really wants mm -hmm. to at the child, yeah. they can take it off. Yes. Uh, due to the reason that we're sending a signal every uh, hundreds of milliseconds, when we take it off, it will send the signal to the uh, daycare or assistant or whoever that like this uh, device will take it off and its alert will be sent immediately. Yes, your question is absolutely reasonable. Thank you. Maybe one more. <laughs> Question. Sure. So, is it like a like a cord? When a cord cuts, it triggers a uh, signal that the device has been moved. Like. No, we don't have cords. We don't have cords at all. Everything is wireless. Uh, wireless. Uh, it's Wi-Fi system, but it's by the sensors. Everything is uh, related on sensors. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. All right. Thank you.